Imagine you ask something like, well, what's the meaning of life? And I would say, well, you should reform out that question because it's not a good question because it implies that there's a meaning to life, a meaning. And perhaps there isn't a meaning. You could ask, well, where do people derive the meanings in their life? Well, you tell me, but I'll make a little list and see if you can add to it or object to it. You probably need a career or a job. Well, why? Well, because otherwise you'll starve and, and freeze. Like, it's a necessity. You have to generate enough to protect you from the elements, let's say, to protect you from privation. That's not a consequence of capitalism or anything foolish like that. It's, it's a consequence of hunger and, and the need for shelter. Capitalism is an attempt to address that, not to cause it. And you could argue that another system might do it better, but that even if you did argue that, you can't lay the necessity at the feet of capitalism. You need a career and a job, partly out of necessity, partly because we need to be of service to other people. We, we need to be of service to the community. It's a deep need for people, especially if they're conscientious and agreeable. Um, you, you need to be educated to, to the limits of your intelligence. You need an intimate relationship. You need a family. You need friends. You need to take care of your mental and physical health. You need to regulate your, the effects that temptations have on you. And you need some sort of higher order spiritual or philosophical pursuit. Well, those are all socially mandated roles to some degree. And you don't want to demolish them because you're left with nothing. Having nothing is not a good place. It's not freedom. That's foolish to think that. Freedom is the ability to choose between jobs, let's say, not to choose whether or not you have a job. When I was younger, when I was 10 or 12, I used to think that being an adult meant doing whatever you want. It's only when I got, when I got older that I realized being an adult actually means having responsibility. Uh, you know, a sign of maturity isn't doing whatever you want whenever you feel like it. It's having obligations and responsibilities toward other people. You just made a case for identity as as social responsibility and duty. That's a lot different than identity as felt sense. I mean, it's just not helpful to have your identity be your felt sense because it doesn't buy you anything. And, and you, you pointed out that for you, there's some peace in fulfilling your roles properly. So you, you have a number of games which you chose to some degree voluntarily, but which are also socially structured. You find satisfaction and freedom from anxiety in playing out those roles properly and that that is what people are like and demolishing those roles criticizing them criticizing them as purely oppressive let's say is not helpful because it leaves nothing and that's a terrible that's a terrible state for people to find themselves in to have nothing you're 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 you have you're very fortunate if you're constrained by a number of functional roles. It's what everybody needs. I mean, some people need less of that than others. If you're highly open in your personality, so fundamentally creative, and you're low in conscientiousness, so you don't like order, you don't need order, well, you know, a little bit of structure goes a long way, but there's many people who, there aren't many people like that who are highly functional. It's also extraordinarily difficult to make your way in the world as a spontaneously creative person. It's very difficult to monetize that. It's, um, some people do it extraordinarily well. They're geniuses. Even they're, they're very rarely economically successful. Belief is what you stake your actions on. Well, I'm, and there's choice in it too, and that's faith, I suppose. So, for example, so faith isn't the dis decision to believe things that are preposterous. And there's a substantial amount of confusion about that, I would say, in the religious community and in the non-religious community. <clears throat> so, for example, you can decide that it's better to tell the truth than not to. And it's a decision because you're not basing your action on your observations of the outcome of the actions that stem from that decision. You've decided to look at things in a certain way. So I could say, 
I've decided to do what I can to say what I believe to be true, because I have decided that, to believe that, to assume that, to have faith in the proposition that there's no better way forward than the truth, no matter what it looks like. And that's the thing, that, that's why, the, that's why the, the decision of faith is necessary, because it gives you a particular angle on the evidence. You know, maybe I get, say I say something I believe to be true and I get in trouble. And then I might say, well, the fact that I got in trouble indicates that saying what's true isn't, it wasn't the right thing to do. It's like, no, not necessarily. It might be that saying what I believe to be true was the right thing to do despite the proximal outcome. You have to make decisions about how you're going to interpret the facts. You have to make decisions about that. Those are decisions of faith. And so then you decide what you have faith in. Well, here's some things that I would like to have faith in if I could manage it, if I could be strong enough to manage it, let's say. I'd like to assume that existence is worthwhile and that we should all work for its furtherance and, and its benefit. And you say, well, is that true? It's, well, there's a lot of suffering in life. There's a lot of suffering associated with consciousness. You could make the case that there's so much suffering that the whole game is suspect. And that's a valid claim. But it's not a claim I want to make. So I'm not going to live out that claim. I'm going to try to live out the alternate claim. All things considered, I think that would be better. You could say, well, you're justified in altering falsehoods if it's expedient. That's why people lie, and people do lie, and so obviously they believe that to some degree, because otherwise they wouldn't lie. But you could decide that you're not going to do that, because that's wrong. Well, that's, a, that's, that's not so much an observation as a proposition. I'm going to live my life as if that's wrong. And I think, I mean, I've derived both of those principles, let's say, the wish for the furtherance of being and the idea that truth is redemptive, those are fundamental Judeo-Christian propositions, maybe the most fundamental Judeo-Christian pro propositions. They seem to me to be valid, or valid enough to stake my life on. And that's the decision of faith. What are you going to stake your life on? That's manifested in action. It's not manifested in your claims about the explicit contents of your descriptions of the world. This ideal does lurk in our structure. And, you know, you can say, well, it's the, it's the, it's the, it's the internalization of a social ideal. It is that. It's more than that, though. It's probably the internalization of a biological ideal. But it's more than that because the biologic, why that biological ideal? Why did that manifest itself rather than some other ideal? These are all ideas I'm trying to work out while I'm writing this next book. See, well, I can give you a bit of a prodrome of that. Men, roughly speaking, gather together in groups to accomplish tasks they regard as significant, important. And they vote among themselves, so to speak, as to who they'll elevate to a position of status and authority. The men are constantly getting together, deciding amongst themselves who they're going to hoist up on their shoulders and carry cheering out of the stadium. And women peel from the top of that. And so the men, met, the men vote on the best men and the women select them. And that's our evolutionary history. That's sexual selection. We're participating in the joint creation of an ideal that's negotiated between the sexes. And I, th I think that's undeniable, biologically. Some people find it harder than other people to make a schedule. You know, one thing you might consider doing is doing the personality test at understandmyself.com and seeing what you're like. You know, maybe you're particularly low in conscientiousness, in which case making a schedule and sticking to a routine, an orderly routine, is going to be quite difficult for you. Um, but that'll at least help you understand 
perhaps at least some of the problem. Maybe you're high in negative emotion or neuroticism, and so you worry too much about making the schedule, and that just stops you from doing it. Um, I would say, well, first thing to do is There's two things you could do, first of all. The first thing you might want to do is figure out why you want to make a schedule to begin with. So you talked about goals. Well, what is it that you want to accomplish? Um, the future authoring program at selfauthoring.com, another one of our websites, helps people make a detailed plan for the future. And so you can't really have a schedule without having a plan because the activities you schedule should be intelligently related to goals you wish to achieve that are important to you. And so you need to have goals that you wish to achieve that are important to you and you have to know what they are. And that's complicated, right? That's like a plan for your life. So it's very difficult. And so that's why we produced this exercise, which helps step you through the process of deciding what you want and need. Um, there's a present authoring program there too that helps you identify your virtues and your faults. And part of your plan can involve capitalizing on those virtues and rectifying those faults. And so that can be an interesting addition to this process. But in any case, you have to figure out what you want. And then you have to figure out how to decompose what you want into actionable steps, right? And those would be the sorts of things that you could put in a schedule. Now, that would mean that your schedule would hypothetically consist of things that you maybe you don't exactly want to do, although that would be good, but at least you understand the importance of doing and are therefore somewhat motivated to do. And then you need to break those steps down into small enough increments that you're highly likely to undertake them. You know, so for example, this is a trivial example, maybe you have to do a report on a given topic for school and you're not very good at that well you know maybe you could go to the library one day and just check out the library that might be enough and then maybe you could go to the library and take out a book and then maybe you could open the book and look through it I mean, those would be on different days and then maybe you could sit down and read the first page of the book and if you can't do that then the first paragraph you know, you have to negotiate with yourself and figure out what the largest step you would take towards your goal is that you would take. And if you don't do it, then you make the step smaller and smaller until you find something that you would do. The next thing you need to do, potentially, is to familiarize yourself with a scheduler like Google Calendar. So the first thing to do is open it and then maybe to figure out how to put in a task and then a repeating task. And it might be a pretty simple one to begin with. It's like, well, why don't you list waking up and specify a time or going to bed and specifying a time, an approximate time anyways, or put in the schedule when you eat. And those are things you do every day. And so that's something you're pretty likely to do. And so that's a success for you. And then. Well, then you can start by putting in something small. Maybe you need to read. Maybe you need to exercise. Maybe you need to uh, have a social event with people. Um, maybe you need to watch TV, a movie, whatever. It doesn't matter what it is. Hopefully it's something you want to do. Put it in the schedule. And you could start by scheduling the things that you would like to do. So you can imagine, well, I like going out to movies. I like going to the mall. I like hanging around with my friends. I like watching TV. I like reading a book. I like listening to music. Well, then schedule those things. And so then you think, well, I, that means I'm forcing myself to do them. It's not that. It's that now you're, you're allowing yourself time to do them, right? So the schedule becomes a means of you getting what you want instead of an external jailer who punishes you every time you deviate from requirement. So you have to make friends with the schedule and the schedule has to be your friend, your ally. Well, I shouldn't use that word, but you know what I mean. It should work for you and not against you. It's not 
You're not generating an external tyrant. You know, you are generating something that you could be um, held to, you know, and, and that's be responsible to, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. It can be somewhat burdensome, but it's not necessarily a bad thing. But generally, you should approach it as if this is something that will help you get what you want. And it's also a pretty good way of controlling anxiety, you know, because one of the most common sources of anxiety is just not knowing what to do. And people often think about that as boredom, and, and it is boredom to some degree, it can be, but it can also be very anxiety provoking. It's like, well, what should I do? I don't know what to do. Well, I have to do something. I, there's all these things I could do, and I don't want to make that decision every hour. So a schedule that you design that you like can be an incredible relief. And one thing we do know is that conscientious people tend to be lower in negative emotion. And it looks like that's a causal consequences that orderly people, for example, because they're, they order their environment and make it more predictable, then they're less likely to be anxious because we're often made anxious by what is unpredictable. So generating a view of your life that consists of valued goals that you want to attain and then steps by which those might be attained and the future authoring program helps you figure all that out. Well, then you can ally that with a schedule and then you know, not only do you know what you're doing, you know that what you're doing is moving you towards something you want, and that's rewarding. And having your time structured like that and, and attaining those goals is pleasurable and anxiety reducing. So, you know, that's a pretty good deal, all things considered. And you can start stupid and slow, like I said, just throw some things in that you're pretty high, pretty likely to do. And fill in the schedule with broad strokes and then as you get familiar with it and comfortable with it and maybe even happy with it you can fill in the details and start to use it in a more sophisticated way everyone i know who's accomplished almost everyone i know who's accomplished does structure their time explicitly in that manner they've learned to do that over the years now, not everyone does that. Really, really entrepreneurial people might have a harder time with it, especially if they're low in conscientiousness. But, um, and then with regard to the personality test, you know, maybe you do a personality test, the personality test I mentioned, say, and you find out that you're agreeable but low in conscientiousness. Well, so it's going to be harder for you to stick to a schedule, but you do like to please other people. So that's one of the things that you could schedule. You'd be highly likely to do that. If you're extroverted, you could schedule time you know, socializing with people. If you're introverted, you could schedule time by yourself, walking in nature, for example, or doing whatever else it is that you might want to do by yourself. Um, if you're open, you could schedule in creative time and then you'd be motivated to do those things. So you have a, you're having a hard time disciplining yourself. That's, that's par for the course, you know? I mean, like I said, Really conscientious people are more inclined in that direction. But it's hard to discipline yourself in relationship to a goal. You know, it's like it's it's like training a cart horse to pull a cart. It's it's difficult. And so you start with little things and maybe little things that you want to do, and then you can proceed to harder things that you don't want to do so much, you know, for their extrinsic or intrinsic utility, but you have to do them because they're related to something important. You get disciplined across time if you do that and incremental improvement that's sustained is extremely powerful from the perspective of transformation so the first thing i would say is that if you feel insecure and less and ashamed and all of that that you have to take stock and look i have an exercise online at selfauthoring.com it's there's three exercises there one helps you write about the past one about the present and one about the future the present authoring program helps you assess your faults and your virtues okay well if you have some faults and you feel insecure and inferior because of that well you should now it shouldn't be so much that you're crippled by it and unable to take action you shouldn't be beating yourself into the ground because you're not everything you could be because no one is and if you beat yourself into the ground then you can't get up and improve but 
you 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 have to differentiate it's like okay to what degree am i being hard on myself counterproductively critical hearing the voice of my too harsh and angry father in my head right. um adopting inappropriate stereotypical representations of masculine competence how much of my self criticism is ill advised fair enough and you want to deal with yourself with a certain amount of care but then along with that there's the well fix your weaknesses you know if you're ashamed of being ignorant you're shown up at a party because you know you claim to knowledge that you don't have and someone exposes you well you can be angry at them and you probably will but they've actually done you a favor they pointed out an inadequacy is a pathway that you can travel down right a recognized inadequacy is as soon it's such a gift in some sense if if it's accurate i mean because you think well what should i do what should i do with my life that's a real complicated question right. oh here's an inadequacy excellent you have a you have a, a goal now rectify it now you still have to think strategically and figure out how to rectify it and do it step by step and but Carl Rogers the psychotherapist um pointed out that the per person for for therapy to be successful the person has to want to change so they have to have recognized that they have a problem if the, if someone is mandated by the court to attend therapy it's very difficult for the therapist to convince them that they have a problem once you're convinced you have a problem it's like away you go you know i know it's still technically difficult it requires discipline and all of that there's no magic solution but if you're plagued by feelings of inferiority you should rectify the most obvious inferiorities right focus on those first over optimizing strengths would you say no not necessarily not not necessarily i'm and you don't have to redress every like i can't i'm a terrible jazz musician <laughs> You know, it's and not a, it's not an it's not a thing where you hold shame around or like. Well, it's not an impediment. Yeah, yeah. I would say that you have to rectify an in inadequacy when it's clearly an impediment to your goal, or you have to shift goals. But if you're shifting goals because of an inadequacy related impediment, then you have to ask yourself: Are you is your desire to shift the goal reliable, or are you just taking the easy way out? You can protect yourself by by picking a different goal that's more difficult. That that's a good mental hygiene practice because sometimes you should switch goals rather than rectifying inadequacies. But you can fool yourself then and and that's a that's not good. And if someone is goalless, lazy, unmotivated, not sure what they want to do, what would be a few key steps to get started to to turn their life around or to find the motivation for something greater than where they're at well i i think a fair bit of that's probably to be found in you can find it in shame you can find it in guilt you can find it in conscience you can find it in anger you can find it in interest and 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 engagement and beauty there's lots of pathways if you're angry about something in the world well you know that's an indication that that's in some sense your problem right it it's speaking to you in a moral sense this shouldn't be that way well maybe you're the person who should do something about it in some manner maybe it'll take your whole life to figure out how to do that but it's bothering you for a reason so that the negative emotions can be a pathway to transformation i'm i'm not trying to romanticize them they can crush you completely and leave you with nothing yeah right for sure and they can go badly astray but shame that's a good one what am i ashamed of well can you fix any of that because you might ask yourself let's say you're so ashamed and so crushed that you're nihilistic and you can't see any hope for life you're just done you might think well What if I was less ashamed? Like I'm not going to jump off the bridge today. I'm going to wait a year. I'm going to not I'm going to work on these things that I'm ashamed of. And and just see like does my life improve enough so that I'm not so bitter about it now or I'm not so hopeless about it now. And my experience has generally been that that works. It works. 
and then some of some of its practical knowledge too it's like you can get a really long way with very small changes incremental changes yeah micro habit changes so aim low don't have big big goals or big transformations well you can but but the problem with a big goal is that it's daunting enough so that it might paralyze you and there's a high probability of failure and so imagine that you're your own child okay now imagine you love this child and you would like him we'll say him because it's you and I talking yeah. to succeed now you have an ideal for this child you'd like him to grow up to be the best he can be better than you the best man he can be that's what you want for your son if the good part of you is talking yeah you definitely want him to be better than you are but you want him to be the best he could be if your vision is unclouded okay but then you offer him a goal it's like well do this well can he do it well if he can do it without a second's thought there's no challenge in it there's no developmental impetus it's not in the zone of proximal development you want a goal that you can do but that requires some improvement on your part because you want to attain the goal that's satisfying but then you want to make yourself into the thing that can attain goals that and so you want to push you to, yourself yeah you, you want to push try, yourself you a bit far yeah yeah yes and 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 there there's an ample psychological literature that suggests that that's where maximal motivation is to be found interesting so you're you're pursuing a goal but you're also pursuing the goal of transforming yourself at the same time you're doing both of those at the same time do you need to know that you're transforming yourself in order to attain the goal or do most people just think i got to take these steps to make it happen but they don't realize they're becoming better human beings they it depends on what you mean by realize they 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 have the sense of satisfaction and confidence that would indicate that although they might not be able to make what that means explicit but i would say it would be better to make it explicit it it adds one other dimension of possible motivation what would you say would be your three truths i would say have the faith strive to manifest the faith necessary to make things better rather than worse pray that you have enough terror to be frightened out of your own deceit and strive to be grateful regardless of regardless that would be that's good enough Jordan, let me ask you this. Are you would you consider yourself happy today? No. And when's no, the last still, time you were when's the last time you were happy? I was happy a little bit last week for for a couple okay. of hours. I'm in too much pain and to be happy still. I mean, it's not like I don't appreciate what's good about my life. I do appreciate it and I I remember it consciously all the time and my wife and I remind each other about it constantly. Um and So I see that all very clearly and I can see where the sources of happiness could lie but I'm still I have a lot of neurological damage by all appearances and it produces quite a lot of pain and so I'm I'm overcoming that I think bit by bit like I have a very structured day so I get up and I have a sauna and then I walk for 6 miles and then I exercise for an hour quite intensely with weights and I dance a little bit to music because while i'm trying to regain control over all my extremities and um that's all working quite well and then i have the podcasts and so forth and so i have a well structured life but it's still not to the point where i would say i was happy 
I'd like to get there. Healthy, really, is really what I'd want. Healthy and fully functioning. I'm running at about 50% now, and it was down to about five for a long time. What's so the, 50 what, is a lot better. No, 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 and that's great to hear. What's the longest, like, if you, if you, were, to, if you were to put uh, outcomes of a life, like you were to say priorities, okay, happiness, I'm living a happy life, fulfilled life, healthy life how would you rank those three for someone like you oh well, healthy is by far the most important but then i wouldn't use those criteria like i think um i'm very pleased if i can say things that i believe to be true i've tried I, i've written about this said pursue what's meaningful and not what's expedient and i would also say that it's useful to say what is true rather than to craft your words so that you get what you want and the reason part of the reason for that there's many reasons but part of the reason for that is that it's unbelievably adventurous you have no idea what will happen if you just say what you think and my experience has been that the consequences are absolutely overwhelming always constantly and you know when i go into a talk like this i don't have a pre I don't have an outcome in mind. I don't want to make a fool of myself. I don't want to say something stupid. Um, I want to engage in an interesting conversation, but but I'm not trying, I don't have an agenda other than that, but it's just to say what I feel in the moment as clearly as I possibly can. It's so adventurous to do that. And it's far better than pursuing a more narrow goal that might be wrong. And so there's an adventure there that, and I, I think one of the things I love about the long form video format is that it in, enables people to engage in the mutual uh, exploration of truth, a revelation of truth, the discovery of truth. And it's so interesting too, that people find that compelling and exciting and watch it and want it. Do you ever catch yourself asking, oh man, maybe I'm in too deep of being this worried genius and I've lost a bit of my oh, yes. happy simpleton. Yeah, well, I certainly experienced that when my health broke down. And the reason for that was that I, I, not only did I get sick, my life fell apart because I couldn't do anything that I used to be able to do. I couldn't listen to music. I couldn't read. I couldn't write. I couldn't think. I, I, I couldn't do any of them because everything that I had done was really was um, complex and difficult, all the things that I engaged in. And what I did realize was that that left me vulnerable on a certain front, because if I lost my, if I wasn't at in peak, peak health, let's say, I wouldn't be able to do those things. And so, I mean, that's why I'm walking now, for example. You know, I said I walk six miles a day and I do that every day. And it's very simple. And I've played a lot of ping pong and I've always liked that, but I never played that much, but I liked that. And um, there, there is some utility in having things around that are rewarding and, and good for you that are less complex. Um, I would say though, that with regards to the conflict between, let's say, you know, miserable wisdom and happy ignorance is that there's, there's different forms of rewards to be found in different places. You know, you can think about this even in terms of personality. One major personality dimension is extroversion. And the reason for that is that we have a, a pleasure circuit and how active that is varies between people. That's what causes variation in extroversion. And we generally equate happiness with the activation of the circuitry that's associated with extroversion. And drugs like cocaine and amphetamines activate that circuit. But there's another personality dimension, which is openness. And openness is the creativity dimension. And there's pleasure to be derived from that as well. And that, so that's philosophical exploration and, and literary experience. And I suppose when you go to a movie, you, you experience a blend of those two things, especially if it's a rather complex movie. So there's different forms of...
engagement or pleasure to be found and some of them are more akin to happiness and some of them are more akin to to meaning and sometimes they come into conflict but but i think all things considered they they work best when they're when they're working together and i i do strive diligently to re, and i think that this has really been brought home to me you know look i couldn't sit down i literally couldn't sit down for almost a year and I, so i lost the ability to sit down i had fantasies for hours of being able to sit by a fireplace and just not move because i had this condition called akathisia which is I learned how in, how valuable it is to be able to sit down. And now when I sit down and nothing is happening, I I'm taking stock of that and noticing what an ob- unbelievable gift that is. And it is really useful to maintain your ability to see what you have that you've taken for granted because you can lose you can lose everything. You can lose things you don't even know you have. I have no idea that you could ever lose the ability just to sit down. but you can uh i wouldn't recommend it so i'm more appreciative i would say of of simpler things than i was i'm more appreciative of other people than i was um i'm probably more grateful all things considered than i was um and hopefully that will continue developing I I have no contempt for happiness. You know, I I tell people don't pursue happiness, pursue meaning. And I think that's true, but if happiness comes along, it should be welcomed. And if you're ever somewhere where that's happening, you should notice it and and be grateful for it and enjoy it and that's for sure. When someone stops me on the street, And that happens all the time. They're usually shy and tentative about stopping me and usually very very polite almost invariably. So it's never a real imposition. And I always ask people, you know, they say if they say that they watched a lecture and it helped, I always ask them why. You know, what helped? And so I had three guys this week tell me. They said, "Well, I was comparing myself to what other people had achieved." and always coming up short and that was hurting me it was making me envious let's say and disheartening me but then i learned to reward myself for small improvements over who i was and i thought well that's really important you know because you you are comparing yourself to the right person then and now you're rewarding yourself you're encouraging yourself for taking the steps that you can that you can take it's really important to do that right and you know now i know that that's important to my listeners and so I'll try to formulate that concept more accurately and communicate it more clearly it's a great privilege it's a great privilege to be able to do this the with the podcasts and the books and it's so it's great it's great well what's the story of your life is it a comedy or a tragedy comedy is something with a happy ending fundamentally and a tragedy as well it starts bad and gets worse you know and is it a tragedy that someone else is imposing on you or some bit bit of you that you don't understand what's the story of your life part of that is well what do you want what are you aiming at that's the reverse of sin right right you're aiming at something what do you hope for when and if you so the exercise basically assumes that you treat yourself as if you're someone that you're taking care of mm-hmm. so that's the presupposition you're valuable despite your flaws it would be okay for you and maybe all right for the universe as a whole if your life wasn't any less any more wretched than it has to be so we could set it up for that right. okay so so now if you were looking 3 to 5 years down into the future and you could you could have what you needed within the bounds of reason what would it be what do you want what do you want from your family What do you want from your friends? How are you going to educate yourself? What are you going to do for your career? How are you going to take care of your mental and physical health? How are you going to resist temptation? What are you going to do with your time outside of work that's productive and meaningful? You get to have it. It's like knock and the door will open. Okay, you got to knock first. Well, and then you got to pick the door. And like oh, I really like this because it is you cannot catch something you're not pursuing. So now if you're pursuing it that doesn't mean you'll catch it but generally you'll catch something interesting along the way yeah. you know that's the that's the thing that's so cool about this let's say you set out a vision you start pursuing it you don't get what you were after 
but you learn a lot as you move towards that destination. And as you learn, your vision is going to change, and you may end up with something that's better than what you were aiming at to begin with, but that won't happen unless you initiate the journey. And that's partly something I learned from, from the Abrahamic stories, with the story of Abraham in particular, because God calls Abraham to an adventure when he's like 85. It's like, get out of your father's tent, for God's sake. Get out there in the world, right? And really, that's how the story is set up. Leave your family and your tent. It's time to get out in the world. Well, what does he confront? Famine is the first thing, tyranny, and the potential loss of his wife. Yeah. It's like Abraham must have been going. <laughs> it's like the tent was lo tents looking pretty good. <laughs> but it's this call to adventure. Okay, so you put together a vision. That's your call to adventure. Get out there in the world and p contend with it. Well, you might not get what you want, but you might find what you need. But it won't happen without the pursuit. And that's part of faith, right? Faith is, I'm going out in the world to seek my fortune. And if I do that properly, then the fates will cooperate with me. What you can do is make people more courageous. That's different. So even if you're treating people who are phobic, like agoraphobic, it isn't obvious that you make them less phobic. What is obvious is that you make them more courageous. So if you're treating someone who's agoraphobic and they, they, they won't go on an elevator, so they're afraid of an elevator, and you slowly expose them to the elevator, negotiating that and they, they get to the point where they can get on the elevator they don't really they're not really less afraid of death than they were they're more confident of their ability to prevail in the face of adversity and that you can teach that and you do that by challenge you do that through challenge so if you want to build someone's self-esteem let's say but i would say encourage them then set them a set of optimal challenges and allow them to watch themselves succeed at those challenges, and that will build it right into their bones. People think that the purpose of memory is to remember the past, and that's not the purpose of memory. The purpose of memory is to extract out from the past lessons to structure the future, and that, that's the purpose of personal memory. And so you're done with a memory when you've extracted out the information that you can use to guide yourself properly in the future. So if you have a traumatic memory, for example, that's really obsessing you, if you analyze that memory to the point where you figured out how you put yourself at risk and you can determine how you might avoid that in the future, then the emotion associated with that goes away. So memory is a, has a very pragmatic function. And cultural memory is the same thing, is that we need to extract out stories from our past that structure our future. And we need that because, well, first of all, if you don't have a purpose, let's say, it isn't that your life becomes neutral in a, in a meaningless sense. It's that your life becomes characterized by unbearable suffering because the baseline condition of life is something like unbearable suffering. And what you have to set against that is a noble and worthwhile purpose. And hopefully, you, hopefully your determination of that purpose is buttressed to some degree by the wisdom of the past because you can't conjure something like that up on your own and if you provide people with nobility of purpose then they can tolerate the suffering of existence without becoming entirely corrupted by it and cultures that don't do that it isn't even so much that they die it's that cultures that don't do that are dead they're done they don't have a story anymore and they don't have a call to adventure and then well, then everyone suffers stupidly as a consequence. It's a very bad thing. So Churchill made the same observation that many of the great psychologists and, and philosophers made in the early part of the 20th century. It's like, bring the story forward and, and propagate it and make it the most noble possible story. And then you motivate people to, do, to transcend themselves, which they need to do. When people talk to me about watching my lectures, let's say. They say, they basically say one of two things, if, if, it, if it's not just a simple thank you. They say one of two things. A third of them say, quarter of them say, when I listen to you talk, it's as if you're telling me things that I already know. It's like, yeah, well, that's exactly right, because that's what archetypal stories are. They're the description of what you already know. But that can be articulated, and then who you are and how you see yourself and the way you describe yourself are all become the same thing. So that's wonderful. Then you're not at odds with yourself, you know? And then you have, mm. then you're a functioning unity and that makes you much stronger and more indomitable.
than you would otherwise be. And then the other thing that people say, and this is more like three quarters of them, is that they say, I was in a very dark place, I was addicted, I was, I was drinking too much, I had a fragmented relationship with my fiancé, and I wasn't getting married, uh, things weren't going very well with my family, my relationship with my father was damaged, I didn't have any aim, I was wasting my time, some variant of that, some combination of those. And they say, well, <clears throat> I've been watching your lectures, I've decided to establish a purpose, I'm trying to tell the truth, and things are way better. And, I've, and so, let's say I've done maybe eight or nine large-scale public talks in the last two months, so that's probably 20,000 people, and about half of them, a third to half of them, have stayed afterwards to talk to me, so that's about 7,000 people who have said that to me. And then people stop me on the street all the time and tell me exactly that story, which is just wonderful. Like, you can't imagine how good it is to be able to go to places you've never been and to have people stop you on the street spontaneously and say, look, my life is way better than it was. It's like, it's so good. And so, and I've got like, I don't know, 35,000 letters from people since last August. It's more than that. I can't keep track of them. And it's exactly the same thing. Like three quarter, a quarter of them say, well, you've given me the words to say what I already knew was true, and thank you for that. I can see that in the audience. It's so interesting because I can lay out a story. People go like this and say, they're doing that all the time. It's like the lights are going on. And that's a really, well, there's almost nothing better than that to watch lights go on when you're talking to people. It's like, that's just absolutely fantastic. But to get this response from people, my father, I have, my father's about 80. I put him in charge of, of going through my viewer email. Um, which is an overwhelming job, but you know, he, we've had discussions about this constantly. He's overwhelmed by the fact that so many people are writing and saying the same thing. It's like, well, I'm, I have a purpose, man. My life actually matters. I finally realized that, and I'm putting it into practice. And I'm bearing up under the heaviest load I can imagine, and it's really helping. It's like, God, and that's tens of thousands of responses now. So it's, it's you couldn't hope for anything better than that. There's zero harm in it, right? It's just people putting their lives together. They're not mucking about with other people. They're not trying to make broad scale social transformations about which they have no idea. Okay. They're trying to make their immediate environment better. And it's working. It's like, great. It's wow. great. A journalist asked me why the audience, why people are responding so positively to what I'm saying. The young men, for example. And I thought, hmm, why, why? Yeah, that's a good question says, well, I'm actually on their side. I'm really happy that, I'm really happy that they're not wasting their lives. I'm really sad to see that people are disenchanted and nihilistic and depressed and anxious and aimless and, and perverse and vengeful and, and all of those things. It's terrible. And then to see people question whether that's necessary and then to start to rise out of it. It's like, it's so fun. Like last night I was at, after my talk, it's overwhelming. I don't usually think about these things, but I was, I was after my talk last night, and so all these people line up, and you know, they have their 15, 15 seconds with me, and they're kind of tentative. They're excited and attentive when they come up to talk to me, and then they have you know, 15 seconds of time to tell me something. I'm really listening to them, and they're hesitant about whether or not to share the good news about their life, you know? and I think it's often because when people share good news about their life, people don't necessarily respond positively. You know, they don't get encouragement. And people need so little encouragement. Yeah. It's just unbelievable. And so they'll tell me something good, and I think, oh, that's so good. You know, somebody says, oh, I'm getting along way better with my father. I haven't seen him for 10 years, and now we get along. It's like, God, mm. great. Yeah. And then the, the power of that, you can't overstate the power of that for individuals to get their life together. The individual is mm. an unbelievably powerful force, and every single person who gets their act together a little bit, has the capacity to spread that around them. Mm. It's, it's a chain reaction, and so it's a lovely thing to see. And That's fantastic.